to talk a little bit about a particular man, an exemplary Cree man named Malcolm Diamond. Uh, Malcolm spoke very little English and wasn't really keen to speak more. His, uh, his strength was traditional and leadership. And I, he, uh, I have some Malcolm Diamond stories that are sort of a tutorial on leadership. So maybe I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, first off, these are not chronological. First off, there was a man and his family who came from Moose Factory to Wiscaganish by canoe. And uh, he was a man who had uh, been in the military during the Second War, so he had kind of veterans uh, status, I guess you could say. Uh, there's a, what they call a gutway that you can take to cut off a lot of distance if you're canoeing from Moose Factory to Wiscaganish. But you have to be careful when you take it because if the tide comes uh, out, it can leave you high and dry in the middle of this gutway. And that's what happened to uh, Edward. And uh, so his family fed the mosquitoes for the night, you could say, and they came in the next day. It was pretty obvious that he had miscalculated and that they had uh, suffered accordingly. And his solution was uh, to find uh, some homebrew and to have a drink and get his courage up and go into the Hudson's Bay store and purchase a pack of cigarettes to be charged to his account in Moose Factory. Well, that's a non-starter. This is before the days of debit cards or credit cards or anything else. This was uh, really a kind of demand for deference that appealed to him. And uh, the man behind the counter working there at the store uh, didn't like the looks of the situation. And so he went to get the boss, the manager, the manager was a replacement, briefly there, but a kind of a brusque, uh, somewhat short-tempered man, who grabbed Edward by the collar and the seat of his pants and hustled him out of the store. So we had a bit of a conflict situation here. At that time, there were no telephones out of Wiscaganish, uh, step for the radio receiver, but there were telephones inside the town. There were connections between houses. We were at that intermediate stage, I guess. And Edward went to the house of somebody that he knew and called to the chief and complained that he'd been very badly treated by this manager and uh, I don't know whether his call came just before or just after a call from the manager to the chief saying that uh, this drunk had come into the store and demanded uh, credit on his Moose Factory account for a pack of cigarettes and this was ridiculous and he didn't want to have to put up with this kind of thing. So here's Malcolm, chief for 12 years. What are you going to do with a situation like that? Well, he knew somehow, intuitively, what to do. He came down and collected Edward, brought him into the store, went to the counter, purchased a pair of a cat pack of cigarettes with his own money, turned to Edward, handed him the cigarettes, and said, you are a guest here, and walked out of the store. Now. This is a situation where Edward had been told that he wasn't behaving very well as a guest. Uh, 
the manager had been told that he wasn't behaving very well as a manager. And so between the two of them, they'd managed to generate some unhappiness and there was just no excuse for it now. Malcolm had figured out a way to resolve the dispute without telling anybody, you really need to behave more correctly. No bad behavior here, please. Well, not a big deal, just a drunk and a pack of cigarettes. Sometimes the situations that he got into were more serious. There was a man uh, there at that time, also named Malcolm, who was perhaps a bit unstable mentally, and he was an older man who was suspected sometimes of being a dangerous old man. And he got into a temper for some reason and had uh, done violence to his wife's sewing machine and announced that he was going to kill himself. He'd had it with this crazy place and these crazy people. So he went out, started to wade into the river. Now, the, the river, river is a big river and in places it is swift and certainly drowning yourself would not be too hard to do, but the call immediately went out to Malcolm Diamond, who sized up the situation, walked in beside the man and said, not, what are you doing? Or you can't do this, or this is crazy, or suicide is a bad idea. So, no, what he said was a question. He said, what will people in the other communities be saying if they hear what's happening at Wiskaganish. In other words, your problem is your problem. My problem is this community and its standing in other communities and what you're doing, he's saying this without saying it, what you are doing is bringing a bad reputation onto your community. The guy turned around and came out. So he solved a potential suicide just through that very skilled way of not confronting. He didn't confront with the cigarettes either. He just bought a pack of cigarettes and gave them. And so in this way, he didn't confront. What he did was to get people in both cases to look at the situation differently. Well, if I'm a guest here, I really shouldn't be making a stink in the store. Well, if I'm the manager here, I really shouldn't be manhandling people that come into the store. And, well, I don't really want to bring a bad reputation down on this community, although I'm feeling pretty damn bad myself. So he could handle things like that. And the ability to think quickly and to deal with things well. Well is a pretty big word here, but to deal with them not conflictually or confrontationally or something like that, but to deal with them successfully. Turn a bad situation into one that's okay. Now, this was a characteristic of Malcolm in other situations, too. Uh, even to the point where he was regarded as being very capable in a, a way that normally would be women's work, a midwife. There was a family in the bush, uh, the woman went into labor, and the birth wasn't happening. Her labor was going on into the second or third day. She was getting weak. They were getting desperate. They were afraid she would die. So somebody went on a forced march to where Malcolm was thought to be trapping, found him, and he came, and I don't know what he did, but he came and, and talked to the woman, and somehow or other, she managed to deliver the baby successfully Baby survived, mother survived, they named the baby after him.
He's the one that made it okay. Another story about Malcolm. Uh, at that time, there was no sawmill uh, at Wiskaganish that was functioning. There was an old, simple sawmill, and once a year, uh, a man by the name of Erland uh, would come, and he was a sawyer, and he would get the machine going and saw logs. And people would bring logs in and stack them up, uh, and the person who had his logs there first would get his logs cut first. That was reasonable. And uh, had a oblate priest there, a Catholic priest, who uh, was not a very capable man and not a very capable priest. And uh, he decided that as a priest he had entitlement. So he put his logs, or had the logs put by people he had employed, at the head of the line. People went to the chief and complained. Malcolm went to see the priest. The priest got quite defensive. Malcolm explained the situation as best he could. The priest called him a liar. That's very serious. Okay. Malcolm didn't engage. He left. And this was just at the time that the new Canadian maple leaf flag was being mailed around to chiefs all over the north because every chief had a flagpole in his front yard and would fly the national flag. Malcolm sent the flag back. What an extraordinary thing to do. He mailed the flag back to the Indian agent in Moose Factory saying, there's another man here who wants to be chief. Well, now, what would an Indian agent do when the national flag is refused? Oh dear, not in his manual. So he chartered a plane and came right away. He went to see the priest. The priest wouldn't answer the door. So he called a meeting, a town meeting, J.S.C. Watt Hall, and uh, just about everybody came to the meeting because the story had gotten around town, and I was there, and the Indian agent uh, made a speech. Malcolm was the best chief on James Bay, he really respected him, and uh, it would be a terrible loss if he was to refuse to be chief and uh, so on. And then one of the men there spoke, a man by the name of Stuart Stevens, talking about uh, what a good chief Malcolm was. And I'm going to come back to Stuart in a minute because that's another story. Anyway, a few other people made speeches about how they wanted Malcolm to continue as chief. Malcolm stood up and took the new flag, unfolded it, and put it around his shoulders like a cape. And he made a speech in Cree. And it was a Cree oratorical style, which I had never heard before. And I couldn't understand the words, but it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It was so, so impressive. And what he said, I found out later, was basically, you know, this is a good place. You know, we're sending our kids to school. We want them to be able to make it in the modern world and, and uh, so on. Basically saying, I'm a responsible man. We're responsible people. We're doing what it is that uh, uh, people want us to do. And uh, we want to get along with each other. The priest, of course, didn't come. The uh, Indian agent paid some men to move the priest's logs so that he'd have to wait his turn. And Malcolm, very much the chief, very visibly and publicly the chief, continued on. A big deal.
a big deal. And uh, I never heard Malcolm or anybody else really use that particular style of speech, although I've heard recordings, mainly from out west, of a kind of oratory that for special occasions. Okay, the story about uh, the first person that spoke in his favor, Stuart. Some months previously, Stuart had been drinking homebrew, was very upset because his old age check or his welfare check or some federal subsidy had not come. So he went to see the chief. And uh, now this is an awkward situation. The chief can't call and demand that a check be issued forthwith. The chief didn't have power over an Indian agent. The Indian agent probably didn't have power over the whoever it was in the federal treasury that was supposed to deliver these things on time by mail. So Malcolm listened calmly to Stuart and then offered him a bag of potatoes, which he had grown himself in his garden. Stuart grabbed the bag of potatoes, threw them on the floor, and then he assaulted Malcolm, pushed him against his wood stove. He wasn't badly injured, but it was a terrible thing to do, a violent thing to do in a community where violence was extremely rare. And uh, went away, and we heard no more about it until this meeting. And who should be the first person to stand up? Stuart needed to make amends. He had done wrong, and here was his opportunity to make amends. And, and so he did, basically affirming that uh, Malcolm was an excellent chief and so on. But Malcolm was pretty discouraged. Uh, that kind of violence was uh, not acceptable. And so he announced when the time for elections was coming around that he wasn't going to be available as a candidate for chief again. As he put it, it's time to give a younger man a chance. Well, a chance at what? A uh, difficult job that promised more difficulty. And, uh, but he did. He followed through on that. The guy that was elected in his place was the fellow behind the counter in the store who called for the manager when the drunk came in demanding a pair of a pack of cigarettes. Isaiah was fluently bilingual, far from shy publicly, uh, but not a leader of the sort that Malcolm was. And so what ha happened would be that something would come up and Isaiah would be hurrying down to Malcolm's house to find out what he should do. And, uh, and Malcolm was helpful, he, he did that. He continued in other leadership roles. I can remember there was a death there, and uh, a natural death, but a funeral coming up. And people take a death kind of hard there. There's a period of grieving that can be pretty intense, and then once that period, a few days has passed, people be back to normal, outwardly at least. But it takes somebody who's got a pretty steady head and steady hand to guide everybody through the process, you know, the arranging for the priest to hold a funeral service, arranging for the digging of the grave, location of the grave in the cemetery, and so on. And I remember seeing Malcolm going about that in the graveyard and the expression on his face to me, and I may have been wrong, but the expression was, you know, 
this is going to be me one of these days. Who in the hell is going to be looking after these things if people don't uh, take these initiatives uh, themselves instead of waiting for me to do it? So it, uh, it was a very serious, but a, an aggrieved expression, partly because of the lack of leadership that was visible there. And Isaiah, as a chief, didn't know what to do, was learning at that moment what to do. So on. Uh, a little bit more about Malcolm. Uh, his second son, Billy, uh, became nationally famous during the Bay James Hydroelectric Project court case. Billy was elected the first chief of the Grand Council of the Crees of Quebec. They formed in reaction to the hydro project and opposed it in court, and so on. Malcolm was the midwife when Billy was born. He and his wife were out near the Pontax River in the winter. Silda didn't think she was that close to delivery, but it turned out she was. Malcolm came in in the evening from his trapping, and here was Silda pretty well into labor. So Malcolm he didn't have time to go for another woman to do the midwifery, so he did it himself. And shortly after Billy was born, a couple of men happened by on their way uh, back to town from their trapping area. And Malcolm was the hospitality person. He brought them in, made them tea, and one of them told me that he, he really felt sorry for Malcolm because here he was having to do all of these things and make them welcome, and which he did well. And uh, with, with very little help. Now, back to the hydro case. Uh, Malcolm was still chief at this time and he went with some other band counselors and with Billy, who was a high school graduate, fluent in English, and a band manager by this time, to uh, the office of the Premier of Quebec, Robert Bourassa. And uh, they were shown in formally the office and Malcolm started to make a speech in Cree about the concerns that they had and Borassa, partly I suppose because it was politically adroit but partly because of lack of political skill was uh, talking to his aides during the speech not paying attention and Malcolm turned to Billy and in Cree said, I'm no help here. He's not going to listen to me. It's going to have to be you now, speaking his language. And uh, that was more or less his, his parting speech, you could say. And Billy went on to be uh, very successful chief and grand chief and negotiator and, and so on. But hard way for Malcolm to uh, put his last appearance in to be simply ignored for the person that he was, for the respect that he deserved, for the information that he had to convey and for the trouble he'd taken to go there and try to talk sense to this man. And of course, in the long run, the protest that Malcolm was making was upheld by the courts. Quebec Superior Court uh, put a stop on the 
construction project that was then overruled by the Court of Appeals. And then Billy said, okay, we'll take this to the Supreme Court. At which point the financial backers, some of them in Europe, who had a lot of money tied up in the Bay James Hydro project, got very uncomfortable. This can drag on a long time. Their money will be tied up. Maybe they would lose. And uh, so Barasa, at that point, was heard to say, well, what do these Indians want anyway? Finally listening. And out of that came the James Bay Agreement, and out of that came other agreements later on. It's a long history. Anyway, the initiative, the initiative there was Malcolm's. Now, Malcolm was the third chief uh, because chiefs, in this sense, is an Indian Affairs regulation that says there shall be uh, a chief and one counselor for every hundred people in the band, and there shall be uh, elections, and, and so on. The first chief there was a kind of an experiment. People uh, persuaded an old man that never offended anybody to be chief, just in case it was going to lead to problems. And uh, he did whatever he did and isn't really remembered for it. The second man, Frank Moore, was uh, a Métis. Moore was a Hudson's Bay manager in Nemiska. Frank spoke English, French, and Cree fluently. He was a skilled carpenter and an intelligent man, and his comment after he'd been chief for a couple of years was, it'll take a good man to please these people. Being chief wasn't easy. So Malcolm was elected, and re-elected, and re-elected. Malcolm was there 12 years until he decided he'd had enough. People were gonna come in and knock him over his stove and throw his charity on the floor with contempt and so on, not for him. And then, after disrespect like that, and that's what it is, what Stewart did was very disrespectful, to go to Quebec City and get disrespectful behavior there. Now, Malcolm was not really keen on white men. You sort of understand how it might be possible. And uh, when I first went to Wiskaganish, I was with another graduate student, with a wife, three kids of my own, and with a recent PhD who was our supervisor. She wrote to the chief. Malcolm would have gotten a letter saying we wanted to come and do anthropology in Wiskaganish. Uh, when we came, he called his older daughter, his second oldest daughter, the oldest one living there, Annie, fluent in English. And uh, we explained what we had in mind and he listened thoughtfully and I said that I, I would really like to find a place to live up at the end of town where he was rather than down where Mrs. Watt had the community hall. Uh, and he said he thought it would be better if I stayed down where Mrs. Watt was. I was kind of disappointed. I was being a flaming liberal there and I wanted to be in there with the native people. Well, Malcolm was absolutely right. Maud was a, a, a widow and she had been there for many, many years, 30 I guess and a bit of a difficult personality. And we had agreed to rent a little shack of hers for a hundred bucks a month and live in it. And she wanted the money. And Malcolm had no idea how problematic we might be as new strangers in town. So it just made sense. You know, let him go down there and talk with Maud and see what happens, which we did. He was right. His daughter, Gertie, 
was a first high school graduate from Muskaganish, just a little older than Billy. And she babysat for us during that first summer. And uh, she had a very pleasant, lively, enthusiastic person. And my kids liked her a lot. And she became a big sister to them. And uh, as I said at her funeral, that lasted for 50 years. She became a part of the family. She lived with us in Pennsylvania for two years, transcribing my tapes, checking the translations, and so on. And uh, when we asked Gertie if she would come down and, and stay with us and do this work on the tape, she said she'd have to uh, get okay from her family. And uh, so uh, I and uh, Sarah went up to speak to Malcolm about this. Malcolm uh, called to his wife because this being a daughter, it was really the mother's province. And Sola was uh, okay with it. We didn't seem to be too scary a family. Went back up. Uh, I guess it was about a year and a half into this, because after the first year we wanted Gertie to stay for another year and teach me Cree, which she tried to do. And uh, anyway, we went up to go on our way to Fort George and do some recording, and we got weathered in in Wiscaganish. And so I was staying with an evangelical minister his family, and I went down to see Gertie, and Malcolm didn't come out. I was just sitting in the front room chatting with Gertie, and her mom was in the kitchen doing kitcheny things, and Malcolm's voice called out. And Cree and Gertie turned to me with a surprised smile and said, Do you want to eat? Now, small potatoes? No, actually not. When you're invited to have a meal with somebody, that's a kind of a commitment. He didn't have to do that, but uh, she'd been living with us all this time, and uh, I had not been hitting on his daughter, and she was happy and well, and so in a way it was a, uh, well, Dick, I guess you're okay. Uh, and uh, so I had some good partridge and dumplings, or ptarmigan, I guess, and uh, that was as close as I got to a friendly relationship to Malcolm. But when we left that next summer, I went by to, because uh, Gertie wasn't going with us then, I guess, to thank him for the hospitality and for letting us have Gertie live with us, and so on. And he listened to this with equanimity, and then he thanked me for buying moccasins and other crafts that people had wanted to sell me, and, and uh, that was about it. He wasn't too interested in the work that I was doing. He didn't object to it. So, that's Malcolm. What else should I remember about him? When Malcolm became terminally ill and knew it and was going out to hospital, but extremely unlikely to come back alive, instead of Billy going down uh, with him or Billy's older brother, Charlie, who was not good in English, he asked Albert. Albert, high school graduate, year and a half at Trent, could easily have stayed on and graduated, but got into a disagreement with a professor there about what he saw as a romanticizing of Indian history that he didn't care for. <laughs> 
But Albert was sort of in Billy's shadow. Uh, Billy was chief, Albert was band manager. And uh, later on, when Billy had uh, what he called the corporation blues, which we would call alcoholic problems, uh, Albert took over Eric Rebeck as the CEO and, and so on. And I think Malcolm wanted to do something for Albert to indicate his respect for him and his satisfaction with him. And so he asked Albert to go with him instead of Billy. And I, I found that quite touching. And uh, of course now he's got a big marble tombstone which wasn't his style. At the time that he was burying people, it was a wooden cross with a name and age painted on it in black paint. Well, I guess that's all I can think of now about it, about Malcolm.